So most of this will probably be familiar to you if you've had a look at our website. Um, this is the Spiritual Yearning Research Initiative. Uh, the purpose of this is to address the spiritual yearnings, existential concerns, and the search for meaning of spiritually curious but non-religious individuals and communities. Now, just a, kind of a <clears throat> thousand foot level um, available funding for this. We've got $2.2 million that we are, uh, up to $2.2 million that we are expecting or hoping to invest in research projects. Um, the expected number of grants we think that will be funded through this, we don't have a firm number here, probably six to 10. What this means, if you do a little bit of division, is that um, there's a range of uh, amounts that we expect projects to request. Um, we are encouraging people to not get too hung up on trying to figure out the ideal request amount. There is no ideal request amount. Uh, put in a proposal for the project that you want to build, that you want to run. Um, so don't try and uh, make your project fit a particular budget figure that you think that we have in mind. Uh, we've given you the overall funding uh, that we have available, and we hope to fund several projects with that, and we are open to a variety of funding amounts um, being uh, represented in the overall cohort that comes out of this. In terms of timeline, initial OFI submissions are due August 19th. So those of you who are familiar with JTF will know that OFI stands for Online Funding Inquiry. That's basically, you should think of it as like a, um, a very short proposal, uh, a sort of snapshot of a larger proposal that you would then develop if the initial OFI is successfully uh, um, moved on to the next phase. So August 19th, OFI submissions are due, basically that snapshot of your, your project. And um, by October 14th, applicants will be notified of whether or not that initial OFI was successful. And for those applicants who are successful at that first stage, you'll be invited to then put in a full proposal. And those full proposals will be due on January 20th, 2023. Uh, then there is a lengthy review period. And by July 14th, 2023, so basically uh, about a year from now, um, applicants will be notified of Full proposal decisions. All right, so that's kind of just the overarching framework for this structurally. And um, the overarching big question that is motivating and driving this whole initiative is how can those who experience a deep yearning for a meaningful spiritual life but find traditional religion unsatisfying fulfill that yearning? So we'll get into a bit more of what we're uh, hoping to unpack um, as uh, over the next few minutes. But before we get into the specifics of Sairi, uh, I wanted to just sort of put this project in context. So the background here, uh, as many of you will know, JTF has been for a while now um, fairly focused on, uh, at least in philosophy and theology, we've been quite focused on um, science-engaged theology. Um, in, this, in the science-engaged theology priority area, uh, we seek to advance research at the intersection of theology and the sciences. Currently, we're focusing specifically on the human sciences. Uh, and we want to support theological work that substan substantively engages with the sciences in inquiries about the divine and spiritual realities. Now, our conception of what counts as theology or a theologian here is very broad. Uh, this would include religious studies and philosophy. And, and uh, so we're not limiting, we're not limiting our conception of theology or a theologian to people who are working in a divinity faculty somewhere. And, and in science engaged theology, we are particularly keen to see scholars closely engage the methods, concepts, literatures, and the research communities of the sciences in their research efforts. Uh, so as I mentioned at present, we are currently focusing on cultivating uh, set projects that involve substantial engage engagement with the human sciences. So focusing on psychological sciences, anthropology, neuroscience, human biology, and economics. And um, concepts, theories, data, and results coming from the human sciences can enhance our understanding, even help our understanding evolve um, around theological ideas, claims, some systems of thought, uh, and enable us to evaluate and revise and improve our theologies in fruitful ways. Now, um, there are four areas that we look at within science-engaged theology. 
how humans think of uh, and engage with divine and other spiritual realities, how human nature might be understood in relation to spiritual realities, theological conceptions of character, virtue, and conversation with the sciences, and the relationship between spiritual realities and human flourishing. And um, now the markers that we're really looking for from proposals within the whole science and age theology priority area are first um, a genuine open mindedness and curiosity about competing perspectives in theology and the human sciences. So we're not really looking here to defend pre existing uh, commitments and theological claims in a narrow kind of rigid way. We really want to encourage uh, true dialogue, true inquiry. Uh, reflective engagement with the sciences and um, to, to do that in a spirit of open mindedness. Uh, a second thing that we're really looking for is a specificity when it comes to theological, philosophical, and scientific claims and bodies of literature. Um, and in the way that uh, the engagement occurs between the subdisciplines, between the scholars in these areas. So we're not looking at vague generalities and broad brush sort of caricatures of the sciences or even a science like biology or chemistry or sociology. We're really looking at that. Uh, we wanna see real substantive engagement with particular bodies of work and critical reflection on specific theories, that sort of thing. All right, so moving on more specifically to SIRI, the Spiritual Yearning Research Initiative. Um, we are locating SIRI within science engaged theology, but it's doing something a bit different. So we're not here focusing so much on existing um, religious communities and believers. We're really looking to support research on the experiences, yearnings, and normative rooted possibilities for spiritual flourishing for those who, who don't find themselves at home within traditional religious communities or who do not find the belief systems of traditional religions compelling. This doesn't mean that, that these people might not move into a more traditional religion at some point. It just means that we're trying to take seriously the experiences of those who just don't find themselves at home in traditional religion at this time. Um, we recognize that people change. We recognize that um, evolution happens in our beliefs, in our communities, in our meaning making. Um, but we really want to take seriously this, the, where people um, are and where they want to go and, um, and not try and fit them into a category uh, that is uh, pre-existing or that does not feel or that is not experienced as um, one that they can commit to. So that's like the starting point. Um, so SIRI, we're, we're adopting the same spirit and method as the rest of science engaged theology uh, insofar as we are prioritizing uh, close engagement between human humanity scholars and the scientific community, namely the human science sciences. Uh, and we, uh, so we value specificity and collaboration. But here we're really focusing on people who, um, who experience longing and experience spiritual yearning are seeking to make uh, spiritual, to engage in spiritual meaning making in their lives. Um, and we're trying to help them find resources and to do new work on these people. So who are these people? Uh, we are not being super specific on who exactly we're talking about. In fact, this is part of the work to be done. Uh, we are very interested in groups that you see here on the screen. So the religious nuns, so those who do not claim a religious uh, commitment, community, or tradition, the spiritual but not religious, the religious duns, so those who have once been in a religion and no longer are, uh, and perhaps agnostics. Um, and again, the kind of core central feature we're trying to target here is uh, those who are actively participating in spiritual meaning making, or they recognize something that they might call spiritual longing within themselves, or perhaps they are interested in participating in spiritual meaning making, don't know where to turn, that kind of thing. And, um, and that sort of that quality of, of, of searching or yearning or seeking is really kind of at the heart of what we're getting at here. Um, so another way of looking at this is asking, who are we not interested in? Well, for the purposes of this initiative, um, we're not so interested in spending a ton of time with the experiences of people who are already like very happily committed in an existing religious tradition um, because they're not really, that's not, that's just kind of not the, the demographic or phenomenology that we're targeting here. Um, nor, however, are we interested in the non-religious who 
are not interested in spiritual matters, who might not experience spiritual longing, um, and uh, might not be preoccupied with questions of existential import. Um, so we're really just we're really looking at people in the gray area between these um, kind of poles of certitude or contentedness. We're really kind of trying to get at that that the people in the middle who who, who are not able to locate themselves uh, in traditional religions. They're also perhaps not the kind of caricature of the happy atheist. And um, so, uh, and I would say again, that we're really um, interested in exploring principled normative pathways for people who are spiritual seekers. So um, we don't only, we're not only interested in sort of um, onward, um, disconnected uh, experiences and practices that might feel uh, might feel spiritual, but are kind of um, perhaps light or existing at a kind of relatively shallow level, right? So we don't want to just contribute to spiritual consumerism. We are very interested in uh, principled, normative, uh, um, kind of like rooted ways of thinking through uh, spiritual meaning making and uh, flourishing. So what are our aspirations here? Three things. First, we want to understand. So, what? Who are the spiritual but not religious? The religious nuns. What are they doing? Uh, what's working for them? What's not working for them? So, a lot of that is quite empirical. So, a lot of psychology and sociology work would be relevant here. Just trying to get a sense of what's happening on the ground for these people. What are we? Uh, what is? What's showing up in the literature? What are the gaps in the literature that need to be addressed? So, kind of a, a descriptive and, and analytical uh, project. Uh, the second thing is that we want to connect connect the experiences of these uh, people with existing philosophical and theological traditions, perhaps also bodies of scientific literature. Um, but we're uh, very interested to see um, where disconnection is happening for people. So it might be the case that many people who are currently spiritual yearners or um, spiritual but not religious um, might well find a, an existing uh, philosophical tradition or way of living to be um, extremely um, powerful and transformative for them. They just don't know what's out there. Uh, and we can find ways of connecting and making salient um, um, resources that are already there for people. Same thing perhaps with um, communities. So like where might be the communities that are going to be great for people who are spiritual yearners and the spiritual but not religious, the nuns. And the third aspiration here would be to explore and construct. So um, what are the new possibilities? So what, what, what uh, going beyond connecting people to what is, um, what, what's the new work to be done psychologically, philosophically, theologically? So I'm not going to say much more about that because that's the whole point is that it's, that's the new work to be done to explore and construct the new, the new possibilities. Um, right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the thematic scope of Syrie. Um, so we're talking about two broad themes here. First is spiritual yearning, and the second is meaning making for the non-religious. So these are overlapping uh, domains, if you will, but they're not necessarily identical. So for example, one can imagine people who experience spiritual yearning, but are not actively engaged in spiritual meaning making practices or experiences. One can also imagine people who are actively engaged in spiritual practices and habits, but who don't actually experience a great deal of spiritual yearning. One can also imagine people who are very uh, kind of firmly committed to a religious tradition who do experience spiritual yearning. That's also interesting. So these, there are differences between uh, spiritual yearning and meaning making for the non-religious, at least as we're currently envisioning it, um, but it's certainly overlapping. And we're interested in proposals that kind of get at both of those dimensions of this, uh, of this initiative. Um, so some potential topics and questions that illustrate the sorts of research projects that we're interested in. Um, I would say note that some of these topics skew toward the empirical, so requiring more work by psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, um, while other topics are more conceptual and normative, perhaps drawing more on the toolkits of the philosophers and the theologians. And that's part of the way that we designed this. We want to have uh, a mix of uh, disciplines uh, represented in the uh, projects that come out of this. So the nature of spiritual yearning, what kind of phenomenon is spiritual yearning? 
How can it be operationalized and measured? These are psychological questions. Um, what do the spiritual yearning non-religious describe as the object of their longing? What's the difference between spiritual longing and yearning and questing and spiritual curiosity? So trying to get a handle on like what we're even talking about when we talk about spiritual yearning. Um, what's the value of spiritual yearning? Is this good? Is it bad to be a spiritual yearner? Is it a problem to be solved? Is it a, an orientation to become comfortable with and live into? Um, what are the differences between people who flourish under conditions of spiritual yearning and longing and who doesn't flourish? So what are the differences here that make for uh, flourishing amongst the yearners? And what are the potential causes and effects of spiritual yearning? Why do some people experience yearning and some people don't? Why do some people find spiritually meaningful practices outside of traditional religions and other people don't? And then addressing spiritual yearning. Um, how might various theological or philosophical resources be made useful to spiritually yearning non-religious people? In what ways are ex-Muslims, ex-Christians, ex-Jews, ex-Buddhists, ex-Hindus similar to or different from each other in this way? How and to what extent can people experience the benefits of traditional religion without holding traditional religious beliefs? And then finally, spiritual yearning in practice. Which practices, experiences, and settings are most effective at facilitating meaningful spirituality among the non-religious? What are the uh, possibilities of ethical or moral commitments and frameworks for enhancing spiritual meaning for people? Like, so committing to a practice or a moral framework, the question in here is, can that become uh, spiritually uh, salient for people and powerful for them? Um, and what contributes to meaningful spiritual communities? How are these developed? What are the role, roles of uh, various spiritual technologies here? What about psychedelics? What about immersive experiences in nature? Um, how might these uh, experiences and habits uh, play a role in the formation of meaningful spirituality among the non-religious? So there's much more we could say here, but I hope this is giving you a sense of the breadth and the, uh, and the scope of uh, topics we're interested in. So now getting more into what we're looking for as we're evaluating proposals. Um, so some of this will be like pretty standard if you're familiar with JTF, but just to go over it in brief, um, what are things that are important here? So we're looking for scientific engagement. So we want to see substantive scientific engagement um, with uh, between people in philosophy, theology, religious studies, and the human sciences. And so this, again, goes back to the, the issue of it needing to be specific and critical and just truly substantive. Um, we are looking for uh, cross-disciplinary program design. Um, now, I should say here that we are not requiring um, we are not requiring applicants to have on their project teams uh, people from different disciplines. However, we do want to see um, cross disciplinary collaboration wherever possible. This does not mean that if you have a pure philosophy project that is perfect for this, uh, then it won't be considered. That's not what we're saying. But on the whole, we are hoping to encourage cross disciplinary scholarship at various levels of project design, program design. Scientific merit. So this is just uh, indicating that we are looking for like good quality scientific engagement, um, additional funding. Uh, we're not, we don't require additional funding for projects to be successful, but we, we it's always a good thing if your institution or can, can um, contribute uh, additional funding to your project. Logistics and feasibility. We wanna see that you've um, really thought through a plan uh, for making all the things happen that you're going to make happen. Um, so is this logistically feasible, what you're proposing? Uh, and, and, and we don't only want to know that you think it's logistically feasible, we want to see how exactly it will be feasible. So for example, if you're, um, if you, if you, if you want to run some workshops, don't just say we're going to run some workshops, tell us like why you're going to run a workshop, what's the structure, what's, what's the um, payoff, why, why are you bringing these people together, um, and kind of show that you've really put thought into the, um, the, 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 the steps of your, um, of your project and your activities. Um, and then of course, expertise of the project team, we wanna see that you've included people on your team that are the ones to include, the people who have the expertise and the professionalism required to make a, uh, a project happen like this. 
um, and resources. We want to see that you've kind of thought through how you're going to be um, spending the money that you're requesting. So you, you, you need to have a good rationale for why you are going to spend, um, uh, why your budget is the way it is. You need to have a pretty good budget. Um, in mind, even at the OP stage, even though it's not going to be very detailed in this initial uh, OP submission, um, but but you need to have a rationale and uh, for the amount that you're requesting, and to have thought through the specific cost effectiveness strategies that you're intending to implement as you go through the project. So, just kind of some high level questions that, that uh, we encourage um, that we're encouraging applicants to consider for the SIRI initiative in particular. One, does my project evidence a genuine open-mindedness and demonstrate curiosity for learning from and addressing competing perspectives in theology and the human sciences? This goes back to what I was saying earlier about us wanting to really see curiosity and open-mindedness marking these proposals. So not merely defending a pre-existing belief, but really seeking something new. Um, two, does my proposal exhibit familiarity with the recent discussion, debate, data, and theory in the human sciences? I think that's, I think I've said enough about that. Three, does my proposal give a detailed plan to substantively engage with primary literature within a specific area of active research in the human sciences? And four, does my proposal demonstrate an attention to the normative possibilities for the religious nuns, the spiritual but not religious, and or spiritual yearners? Now, this final one might not be applicable to everyone. So say if there are, is a team of uh, psychologists who are doing some experimental work, they might not need to pay attention to the normative dimension of things, but for cross-disciplinary projects that are involving philosophy and theology, perhaps sociology, we do want to see some, um, some attention paid to uh, the perceived lack of um, conceptual normativity and a, a sort of a principled approach to spirituality for the non-religious. Okay. All right, so what direct costs are allowable as you're working up your budget? Um, personnel costs, so salary, fellowships, honoraria, benefits, that sort of thing is fine. Uh, research and teaching materials, so anything you need to do your research, books, journal subscriptions. Costs for meetings, workshops, seminars, conferences, including travel and lodging. Um, but again, we wanna see sort of rationales for all of these. Uh, costs of collecting or analyzing empirical data, if that's relevant to you. Now for this uh, project in particular, uh, there are a couple of special requirements. So because we are funding um, sort of a set, a cohort of teams, um, we are keen to encourage a sense of cohesion and collaboration and momentum. And so we are asking that projects should have a start date between August 1st, 2023 and January 1st, 2024. Uh, so I should say there that uh, that January is inclusive of January 1st, 2024. So if you want your project to start in 2024, that's fine. Um, and an end date after February 2026. And then the second thing, and this is to keep in mind as you're developing your OP submissions and budgets, uh, successful grantees must design their proposal so that someone from your team uh, is committed to attending two research workshops tentatively scheduled for January 2024, so at the beginning of this period, and January 2026. Um, of course, we, you know, we're not, we're not, um, we are not saying for sure that these workshops will happen, but if we are able to um, make, make them happen, um, we are requiring uh, we are requiring applicants to make provisions for that. So basically the idea is that someone from your project would come to these two events that we are hosting. Um, the purpose of these events first will be, the, for the first one will be to allow grantees to present proposed projects, to receive feedback from other grantees and to stimulate uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, and the second will be for grantees to present their findings and to stimulate for future collaborative efforts. And this is important, uh, the request amount uh, in your overall project should include funds for this, which we've detailed here, uh, to cover travel and lodging costs for these two workshops. And you'll need to make sure that you, you are not going over um, your, the 10% cap uh, on travel and lodging costs. I'm not gonna go into detail here about what that means, but you can find information on the, these travel and lodging caps on the project page. So just a couple of tips real quick for the, uh, 
OFI forms that, that are going to be submitted. Um, on the OFI form, we're only asking for a bottom line request amount and a brief budget explanation. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to go to town developing a, a lengthy budget. In fact, you can't. We have uh, limits on characters on the OFI form, so it's very constrained in terms of space. Um, so just bottom line uh, amount and a brief explanation. Uh, key thing here between outputs and outcomes. Difference between outputs and outcomes. Outputs refer to activities or deliverables, uh, deliverables that would be produced during the project. Um, outcomes refer to hoped for consequences of the outputs during and after the project. Way to think about this is that outputs are things that you can control. You know that you will be able to produce this, perhaps short of another pandemic, but like outputs refer to things that you can control. Um, outcomes are uh, sort of like longer term shifts or changes in the wider scene that you hope will come, um, but you cannot control. Um, this also goes to things, speaks to things like um, publications. So for example, as an output, you would not say something like, I will have published and it will be available on bookshelves a new monograph. You can't, you can't control the publishing process. What you can say is that you will write and submit a manuscript for publication, that kind of thing. Uh, some constraints on JTF grants. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through, I won't go through these in detail here. Um, you can find this information on the JTF website uh, and the project webpage. Um, but basically, projects to US public charities, uh, so in the US or US public charity, usually cannot go over 36 months in length. So you're really looking at about three years here. Uh, projects to non-US organizations generally can't go over 33 months in length, so just sh shy of three years, um, and there are complex reasons for that. Uh, overhead and indirect costs built into your budget cannot exceed 15% of direct costs, so um, overheads can't be more than 15% of direct costs. Uh, a grant's travel and lodging budget, what we call TNL, uh, for conferences and workshops can't exceed 10% of the grant amount. Um, however, if you are an employee of the grantee institution, you are exempt from this rule. So um, travel and lodging can go over 10% if you are employed by the host institution. Uh, and then the final thing is certain capital expenditures cannot be supported on grants to non-US organizations. So you can't buy a car with grant money, that sort of thing. And again, there are some, complex details around that that you can find on our on, on uh, initially on the web page uh, the project page 